You're listening to The Grunt Workers Show, and I'm your host, James C. Zolman. Here's one of my favorite snippets from this episode. You know, we have five senses. We have smell, sight, touch, taste, and uh, hearing. And if I asked you, what did you, lis- what did you listen to yesterday? What did you watch yesterday? What did you wear yesterday? What did you, um, what did you eat yesterday? You'll, like, you probably don't have to do much hesitation to kind of remember those things. But if I asked you what did you smell yesterday, you'd look at me like, what the heck is she asking? She might have three, like, the look of me like I have three heads. And I realized our sense of smell is such a, like a thing that we just don't think about. But I think because I, that, that process, I was, I guess when you're in such a bad place and you're just feeling emotionally horrible, that investment, that, that sucking in of the scent actually awoke me in a way that I wanted to start living again. It wasn't immediate, but all of a sudden I got excited. Hey, welcome to the Grunt Workers Show. I'm really, really excited about today's guest. I've been a huge fan of Tamar for a long time now. She, and and in fact, I think I was first introduced to her through her work at one of the major, major tech publications I want to say 13, 14 years ago. Maybe it was 10 years ago, but it seems like it was a lot longer than exactly. that. So yeah, yeah. So I've been following Tamar for quite some time. I've loved her writing style. She covered the marketing industry, software, tech, and that's where I started to get to know her. I don't think I really met her until conferences much later when I, when I finally was speaking. And then I personally hit under a rock for about eight years. And uh, Tamar has been through and done so much for the industry as a whole in digital marketing, but also um, she's been through a lot personally. So I'm really excited to have her on the show today. She is a mother first and foremost. She's an author. She's a professional hustler, entrepreneur, Tamara Weinberg. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, James. I'm so excited to share and talk about that and yeah it's been it's it is pretty long it was a long time ago a uh, lot a lot that also i took a hiatus for a long time and that's sort of something i'll, I'll be talking about in just a bit awesome yeah sounds good so so what are you working on right now tamar i've seen i've seen a lot coming from you you've been starting to make guest appearances recently um you were on the gary vaynerchuk show um you're doing some amazing things right now and you're doing them in the middle of the pandemic which yes. I like the mask, by the way. That, that's why I'm putting it on, because what am I working <laughs> on? If, if the light will do it justice, that thing right there. Um, I, launched, I launched a perfume brand, and it comes from an unlikely story, because, yes, you just introduced me as, I know her from the tech and software and marketing world and fragrance. What? Where the heck did that come from? And it is, the story is actually pretty unique in the sense that I was a what you would consider pretty uh, early adopter in the social media marketing um, and, and technology spaces. I worked for Lifehacker for Massable. I wrote for Search Engine Roundtable. I contributed to Search Engine Land, Marketing Lands. I was a big power user of Spin, Spin, yes. uh, back in the I day, Dig, and, and, I was, and I wrote a book on social media marketing in 2008 before it was like even a thing. And then in 2009, the book finally, I wrote the book in 2008, but 2009, the book was published. Uh, so funny story there is that I was pregnant. Uh, my book was actually almost pulled. Uh, there was a sort of an infrastructure change uh, internally. And they're like, the book that I had just submitted, like I submitted like a week prior, they're like, we're pulling it out off of the docket. Like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh, no. I just put all this effort into this. And I like, it was 15 hours, 16 hour days. Writing a book is not an easy task. And um then they, I guess, I don't know, I pulled at their heartstrings telling them I'm a pregnant woman right now. <laughs> Let me do this book. This book would be powerful. And, and it, ended up being, it, it ended up working out for them. But I guess it was slightly delayed. So that was February 2009. And the, the, the funny story is the fact that in the book, uh, was both uh, book and baby were due in June of 2009. Oh, wow. And the book, the baby came six weeks early in May. And the book came like six weeks late in July. <laughs> So uh, that the, the funny story is that my babies were not born at the right time, but, 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 <laughs> but taking, but, but then it was like, I guess, you know, it worked out for O'Reilly, the publisher, because, you know, the book ended up going into a second edition and it was published in five different languages and it like a second edition in, at least in Germany was, was actually massively popular there. 
And like, I mean, it was, it was, it, it was lucrative for them, but I guess it was also, when you write for a book and you're a publisher, I mean, you're, uh, the, the author is really kind of required to do the marketing and I had the baby. So how possible was that to do? I got, I certainly got a tremendous amount of coverage in the context that I was able to, but I guess, you know, could I have done more? Could I have gone on like, you know, they talk about like authors going on roadshows and kind of like doing book signings at the different Barnes and Nobles of the world. Um, I didn't have the ability to do that. So, you know, I'm sitting with my firstborn, but where does this tie into like how I am, how I got to where I was and how it became in fragrance is the fact that when I had my child, probably about like a few weeks in, I started realizing that, not, not realizing, but I realized that the joy was kind of sucked out of my life, but I didn't have the complete awareness. So I would like to say that I became mildly uh, postpartum depression. Like, my, like I'm, all of a sudden, my emotions were kind of being poured into my child and no one was really taking care of me, you know, and that's sort of what happens in motherhood. I couldn't actually articulate this until recently. Um, I still wanted to have more children and I had three more. So I have four children now. And um, yeah, but it was hard because I didn't have the awareness that I was actually like having children, but I was depressed. Like I ended up being depressed for um, a long time. I, it was nine years actually, you know, all in all. Wow. Um, by 2016, um, I actually, uh, and this is sometimes where I overshare, like I, I, I guess that fact that my, my needs weren't being met, finally something and somebody was sort of kind of meeting those needs and I became dependent and that dependency is never a healthy thing. And it ended up imploding. And the short version of the story is that I hit a rock bottom. Mm. And that depression really basically spiraled. And now, then I had, by then, by, by the time that these things were starting to be met, um, I was seeing a psychiatrist twice a week, not a psychologist, but a psychiatrist twice a week. I was on a plethora of medication and I was, I was miserable. Um, and when finally, when things really completely fell apart, um, I spent my life waking up. I, this is, I'm in my office now. You can kind of see that there's like light. Like I was in my bedroom, hold up, uh, hold up over my laptop like this. I just, I didn't even want to be seen. Like the fact that I'm out here is actually, you know, thinking about how I, where I was two and a half years ago, the fact that, that the fact that I'm doing this now is actually an accomplishment. Like it's actually a massive, um, massive, it's a very positive thing. So it is good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I woke up at that point, I went through the motions and I went to bed and I continued doing that for months. And then one day I found a tiny vial of perfume like this size, uh, maybe I have one of these things here. Um, this is actually a bigger one, but I found a tiny little like sample I can get at the store mm -hmm. and I put it on and I don't know what happens, but the, the way I liken it to is there's two things that I usually say. First of all, when you're depressed, you don't care what you look like. You definitely don't care what you smell like. So you're not putting it on as the way perfume is marketed to like appeal to other people and so other people be like, you smell very nice. Actually, no, I don't, that, I don't, obviously I don't care. I mean, you know, I wore, and I'm sorry, you, you kind of saw it before, I wore socks and Crocs and like sweats and over like, you know, whatever it was. And that, that like I would wear them in public. I, I wasn't invested in my appearance. I wear the same clothes like for three days in a row. Um, that was like me in the height of my depression. And, um, so, so I definitely wasn't wearing perfume for any other reason, but the fact that I just wanted to put it on one day and I, I don't know what the deviation was, this tiny thing. But then the other thing I also share is that, you know, we have, and now, and now I start to see it, um, is, you know, we have five senses. We have smell, sight, touch, taste, and, uh, hearing. And if I asked you, what did you listen? What did you listen to yesterday? What did you watch yesterday? What did you wear yesterday? What did you, um, what did you eat yesterday? You'll like you probably don't have to do much hesitation to kind of remember those things. But if I asked you what did you smell yesterday, you'd look at me like, what the heck is she asking? She might have three like the look of you like I have three heads. And I realized our sense of smell is such a like a thing that we just don't think about. But I think because I that that process. I was, I guess, when you're in such a bad place and you're just feeling emotionally horrible, that investment, that, that sucking in of the scent actually awoke me in a way that I wanted to start living again. It wasn't immediate, but all of a sudden I got excited. And the first, the fact that I was excited was like that little impetus to start trying new things. So I went on a spree of buying like perfume. First of all, in this particular brand, I basically bought their entire store at 40% off because I found the coupon online. 
And oh. on the night, yeah, yeah. I spent the next couple of weeks kind of like going to Sephora and trying on perfume basically from here all the way to here and realizing that it's a very different process. <laughs> <laughs> and and I and I, I bought some lots on eBay, and I also took advantage of the free cycles and the buy nothings of my community. And I specifically asked people to give give up their perfumes that they didn't want. I ended up amassing a pretty decent collection. To and and every single one that I tried, ex with the exception of like I would say like five percent, is I liked or tolerated. And I got excited each time I did it. I I, I got excited. And I started to learn, like leveraging our sense is so important. It's so important to kind of think about scent. And not in a way that normal people do. The reason why perfume, some people are like, I'll put it on because it's my signature scent because I care about how other people perceive me. But it was for me, this was all about an internal investment in myself and self care and self love. And I, I said, I, I knew that I wanted to do something in perfume and I was going to start a business in it by, that, by the end of 2018. Um, and I decided, I, I was actually, we're, it was just, so we just had Thanksgiving. So two years ago, Thanksgiving, I was at my uh, sister and brother-in-law and I said, I told him the story. He's like, you should call it Tamar. And I had just purchased Tamar.com. Oh yeah. You're cool. like, uh, yeah, this liquidated, uh, the, the business that previously owned it went into bankruptcy and I worked, I had a connection with her. I was able to figure out who was representing them and I was able to buy it for a decent price. And I said, you know, I was going to use it for my resume. So what the heck, what am I going to do? But I'm like, I have Tamar.com. Why don't I just start the brand using tomorrow.com? So 20, I decided I would. And 2019, I didn't, I wasn't hundred percent sure what I was, what was going to do, but I decided I'm going to start a brand with the, even though it's an extraordinarily competitive space, it's probably easiest to just start two personal, per, like two personal fragrance line, like a, two, a fragrance line with two cents initially, because otherwise if it's just one, it might limit, you know, options that have at least two. Sure, the paradox sure. of choice don't have like 4,000, but don't have like one. You yes. need at least choice. <laughs> so, and I spent the last year kind of learning, learning myself and kind of getting raw and vulnerable. And that's why you say you've been through so much. And I guess it's kind of like, yeah, I went through hell and depression, not realizing, looking back and then realizing I used to, in the beginning, I knew if anyone who knows who, who kind of has followed me might know that I, um, I share a story about how Tamar is a result of some sort of traumatic event that I went through. And yes, it's true, but that story has sort of been refined because that traumatic event didn't work in isolation and I was partially at fault. I used to kind of blame, put the blame elsewhere. And then I realized, you know, I'm in control here and I'm going to create my, like I'm, everything I say and everything I do ultimately comes down to me. And yeah, you can never shirk responsibility if you're somebody who's in the growth mindset, you have to accept the fact that you're doing something um, that you're, you're contributing. You can never, you, like, I don't know if I want to get into this. Actually, probably, I probably shouldn't, but ultimately any, anything in your world, and, and I'll, I'll just say the word politics. I, I will shirk from that because I'm, I'm in control of my destiny. Um, there's a podcast called Fearless and Motivation, not podcast, but there's a, there's a, an artist on Spotify. I listen to them when I run usually called uh, Fearless Motivation. And they talk about like, I, I'll let them, I'll just let their commentary reign on this one. But, you know, they're like, don't defer to the government, take control of your future. And at this time, at this point, everything I do is my, it's, it's ultimately in my power. And that's how I look at the world. And wow. yeah, and so I'm, I'm starting this and, you know, am I making like right now it's complete bootstrap business. And is that a mistake? I don't know, but <laughs> um, it's my future. It's my destiny. I'm creating. Yeah. 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 Wow. Tamar, that's absolutely incredible. If you don't mind, I would like to, if it's okay with you, I would like to talk a little bit more about depression and what that looks like. Because I don't think, I don't think we talk about it enough. I think it's almost oh, like an yeah. addiction. It's sort of this taboo topic. But I think marketers actually go through that quite a bit. Everybody does. But I feel like marketers, there's back in 2005, 2008, when, when, um, when, I was growing up in this space, following you, learning from you. Um, you know, I started in 2004-ish. And, and over the last 16 years, I've seen it become more machinated, less human-like. And I think that's part of the reason why I'm so excited to be doing this show, because I get to meet incredible influencers like yourself who have been through something and can share about it. 
So on the depression side, with everything getting more machinated, marketers working harder than ever before, the long days, now we're all working from home, which is great for some. Me, I've worked from home my entire career, so I love it. But I yeah. see a lot of people going through the mental gymnastics and it can kick them into depression. I also really, really like how you brought up that a perfume sort of started your journey out of depression. But even more importantly, Tamar, maybe you can address all of this. And I know this is a really long question, but I think I, I, I'm, I'm a feminist in the space. I love encouraging my wife whenever she has a dream to follow it, to do everything she can. She likes to work. She likes to do book work. She, she uh, owns a piece of her family farm because she wants to. And I encourage that. She is, for, in every sense of the word, wealthier than I am. And I don't say that to demean that. I say that because I love that. I love seeing women succeed. It's, and I, I literally get a thrill out of it because I think that, that um, it's an uphill battle for you. You have to work harder than everybody else. Right. And um, motherhood is, I see it being said as, as the most rewarding. And I have a few kids of my, my, my own and my wife will say it's, it's absolutely rewarding. But at the same time, I see so many go through that, that bout of depression, the postpartum, the... Uh, it's, it's incredible what you go through as a mother, plus trying to work on top of that. It's, uh, it's hard. It's, it's yeah. insanely hard. So if, if you could, can, can, can we, um, would, would you mind going through sort of the resources you found that have helped you through all of that, I, I like the, the catalytic mechanism. That, that, that's a term I learned in business, but I think it applies to personal life where, you, where that, that fragrance helped you. But what else? What else was there that helped you when you were in your deepest, darkest times? Right. Because, because other people, listeners here, will need that. And uh, yeah. I'm so grateful you're, you're willing to talk about it. I, I hopefully, I have four points to raise, but okay. I hope I remember all four of them. First, first thing is that I think I only started being happy living probably in the last two years. Even in, when before I hit this postpartum depression, I probably was depressed. I started to think about it in the marketing space. I think things started falling apart right before um, I, like, as I became a big popular uh, marketer, people like looked up to me and I, I think maybe there was some induced stress to kind of exceed expectations in every way. And I remember like even kind of even with some of my friends, like a, that sort of went to my head. And there was a point where I was at a conference um, in probably 2008, 2009. And we were, there were all these conference goers waiting online to like get a signed copy of a book. And for some reason I had the sense of entitlement, oh, I could cut the line. <laughs> and I remember somebody saying to me after the fact, Lisa Lillian probably, I think, I think it was, no, I, don't, I don't know, I don't think, I know that it was. Lisa told, told me like this, you know, probably like, probably should have done that and I'm like you're right but I didn't like and I still look at that and it's 13 years later like 10 well whatever it was it wasn't me yeah, I was definitely 2008 7 2008 and that was that was it was Andy Beale's book radically transparent <laughs> I don't know where I was where, where my head was but things started to fall apart for me because I guess I, I like ego obviously was a big part of that and I think that why did I, why did I think I needed that? I, I don't, I, right now I don't see myself as better as, than anyone else. I feel like my, you know, I have my own way and this is un, my new, unique way. But I think when you're young and younger and trying to figure it all out, it could, it could ruin you. And I think that started what maybe was part of the, the drop, um, the, where things change. That's item number one. Okay. Now, item number two, um, is that when we work from home right now, I mean, yeah, I also have been working from home since 2007. I, I, you and I probably are doing like, I, I, and, I, and I definitely empathize and I sympathize with the folks who don't because for me, the coronavirus pandemic has been actually kind of great for me because like I know how to thrive in this, but people do not. And it's difficult and I wish I knew the solution. I, I, I will say that I did very well uh, for myself, because you know, I live in New Rochelle, New York. That if anyone actually Google's New Rochelle and coronavirus, they will see that we were the first city in the United States with confirmed community spread. And I was part of that community spread. I ended up getting sick, 
Um, March 3rd was the day most of the country shut down, uh, March 16th and, and subsequently. Not even like in the, you know, where you live, probably not in, not for many, many weeks later, but March 3rd is when I, when I shut down. And the first thing that our community do, did was we opened the WhatsApp group. And that WhatsApp group, I didn't know any of the community. Like I, I was part of my own community. And this is my synagogue. So this is my religious community because this, it actually started with a member of my religious community getting sick and falling ill. So 10,000, uh, 10, a thousand of us who were affiliated with that congregation who had been to certain events where there was potentially their super spreader events before we knew, yeah. um, we were told to shut, we were told to isolate. So we did. And wow. the first thing we did was to solve that isolation. We had, we had a WhatsApp group. And I will say that that was the, one of the best things that happened to me because all of a sudden, like I, I used to feel socially like distance from this community. And all of a sudden, because maybe we don't like when, when you're, when you're at like any type of event, you'll, you'll like, like attracts like, but there is no like when you're seeing your name on the screen, it's just a name and everybody's in linear fashion. All of a sudden, like there was no, like there was no discrimination. Like I guess you normally do socially. So for me personally, that helped so much. And I had written on medium about like perspectives of a person in quarantine is what I had written. And I'm like, I actually hope that quarantine doesn't end in a way. <laughs> Obviously I didn't expect this prolonged quarantine. And at that point it was just me thinking that it was just gonna be me and my community in two weeks, I'll get out of quarantine and life was gonna be better. But nope, I didn't realize what we were in for. Um, should have knew to invest in, should, should have known to invest in Peloton and Zoom back in the day <laughs> too. <laughs> You know, I just thought we were in an isolated thing. So I, but I will say that I did a lot better because I think we had communities and we were able to connect in that way. And I think it's important for anybody who feels alone that that, that could be a coping mechanism. Um, let's see, what number, point number three, I, I had multiple points. Okay, here's the point. I have, this is in my hand, are people who have pre-ordered my package. It's almost done. These are, this is a story about um, my products and it's like kind of a thank you, thank you notes. Wow. I will, Hand wrote all Those of these. Are handwritten. Handwritten Holy thank cow. you notes that are going out to all the people who pre ordered. Wow. And on here is sort of like, how do you use print fragrance? So um, the answer is, and, and this is like to solve that problem, not so much a problem. I, first of all, it's not, it, this is not a, this is a unisex fragrance. So it's anybody could wear it. Ultimately, fragrance marketing is, uh, fragrance being genderized, is, it all came down to marketing. So mm -hmm. I'm unmarketing fragrance. But I the way that, I, say, I see it is that you put on fragrance. Fragrance is so associated with memory. So if you put on fragrance with this, like a mindset, a specific mindset, like I, today's gonna be great. It's weird, it's, it sounds weird. Anyone who does affirmations might find like, weird, like affirmations don't work. But because scent and memory are so closely intertwined, I think the alignment is better. You put on like say, scent with like, today's gonna be awesome or like something's gonna be awesome. And then you go like this, I'm actually trying to, I say, I want to normalize wrist sniffing. And I go like this throughout the day and I revisit those thoughts and it grounds me in the moment. It, it's, it becomes like a moment of presence. If you're into like any of that mindfulness stuff, my biggest competitors are common hit space because those products uh, kind of do the same thing. But mm -hmm. for me, I don't like it's that, that's sort of my biggest challenge as, as someone who was trying to market something that is almost impossible to market because there's no niche for this yet. It's not, it, it is perfume. It is 100% high quality artisanal perfume. But like, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like more of a health mindfulness, essential oils, the marketing message. So how do you meet in the middle? Mm -hmm. And like, I'm trying to figure that out now as I'm like evaluating SEO software and I'm like, who are your competitors? Well, my competitors are this, this, and this only because they sell perfume. But my other comp competitors are this, this, and this. And they're mindfulness things, but no one's gonna be searching for my products. So what the heck? So I'm that's I, that will that I'm gonna make that admission that I'm struggling with trying to figure that out. Um, and what is point number four? I actually forgot. <laughs> so that's I will okay. have to. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly like a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. I mean, there's lots to share. Yeah, yeah. So um, great, great points on on all of those. So, so the first one was don't don't be so full of yourself and just i don't know i wouldn't i wasn't saying like it was that wasn't even a, a tip it was more of the fact that i didn't like i realized that things were starting to fall apart and now i feel like i'm, I'm like i feel like the best is yet to come gotcha. i didn't oh, think I was, oh okay it was oh. yeah it's not advice about being wrong not, clarification yeah it was yeah it was it wasn't advice it was more like just me reflecting on like where i was and how, like how 
kind of like, I think this was sort of like a stepping stone to falling apart even before that. I think mm -hmm. it, it obviously, it, I think most of it tied to, um, you know, just postpartum, po it really was postpartum depression, but I, I certainly think there was some, some of that, those gears were already moving in that direction. Sure. So I, I, I think I was, I was uh, taking your, your first, um, your first story as, as, as far as uh, what, what to do or what to look for as a way to say that you are in control. Just, just like you've decided on your way out of this, <clears throat> out of depression, you're in control. So try to stay in control of, of you and of, of your outcome with those affirmations. And then the second thing that you mentioned was to find that community so that you can feel free and, and freed in general. And then yeah. and the third thing was the self-affirmations, the NLP, neuro-linguistic programming types of things, um, put other senses and common senses around you, not only sense as in S-C-E-N-T-S, but also other senses, hearing, you know, listening to music and tying it to a activity that makes you happy, getting the right smells on you, preferably Tamar, getting the, the Tamar perfume on you and uh, attributing that to your affirmations or any other sort of neuro-linguistic programming types of methods. Yeah. And that can help significantly. How can we... I got number four. I got number four. Oh, okay. Yes, please. It's not so much number four. It's like, I, these were just thoughts. They weren't like suggestions. But like, I think when you're depressed, the, the, my biggest challenge for, I think the biggest challenge for most people is they don't realize that they're depressed. And that's sort of where I, I faltered. I didn't realize that I was depressed for seven years of the, the mm. postpartum depression that I was in. What I, and I wrote about this on Medium as well. I wrote about like from a brand launch during a pandemic. Um, you I know, remember from, reading that. Yeah, great, that was my piece. One of my most, my most raw piece I've ever written in my entire life. And um, I thought that that was like, I thought it was very powerful to finally get that on paper. Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that again. I have to one up myself. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the struggle for myself was that I didn't have own awareness that the joy was sucked out of my life. Like I was, there were times when I was happy, but I never really experienced joy. And by at that point, there were a couple of things that now I look at myself and I'm like, where the hell did I come from? I was jealous about people all the time. Um, I even remember, uh, I'm not going to name him here because he is an industry person but he was hired for a job that I didn't even apply for. But based on, you know, my credentials, I was like, I should have gotten that job. Like, why would I, again, this is sort of like an ego thing, but it, I don't think it was an ego thing. It was more of an insecurity and in the fact that I just, the depression was like pronounced and not, but it wasn't a, a visible to me for whatever reason. I did not, I, it was like, there was jealous. There was a lot of jealousy. It was like, why should I help somebody? Because they're going to get ahead and I'm not. And why would you feel that way? So like these days I help anybody and I'll do things that are outside my comfort zone all the time. I will ask people, people ask me all the time these days, can you introduce me to this person? I want this job or can you do this? I'm going to, I want to sell them something. And in a way, sometimes like those leads are, are usually, those are not like, you know, those cold leads that you get on LinkedIn. I'm sure you get them all the time. Sure, I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But like when it, when it, and when it's, when it's informed in this way and it's researched, I will make, I will do that outside my comfort zone. Because what's the worst that could happen? Someone's going to get maybe a little upset that, that you, you might have invaded in their personal space. Ultimately, I think there is, I, I, like, but that, that was a mindset I never had before. Like, mm -hmm. But ultimately, like, they're going to forget. They're, they might be in, like, miffed for like two seconds, and then they're gonna, like, in a month later going to be like, some of these people on LinkedIn, who's Tamar Weinberg? <laughs> like, <that kind laughs> sure. So I'll take, I'll take it. Um, I think the biggest struggle, just going back to the depression in general, though, I think the biggest struggle is that people don't recognize that they have it in the moment. Mm. And, and it's like, it's like, I don't want to say because like the, the chain, the tipping point for most people in general is um, it's, it's sort of like, it's likened to like, you know, trying to quit smoking or getting, going on a diet. You're not going to be able to do it until you're really motivated to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how fragrance really did that, but fragrance also wanted me to live again. And then when I, when I, I finally was on the other side, I look back on this and I'm like, holy crap, this is not something 
like I look back seven years, it was, well, it was at that point it was nine years. I look back nine years, I'm like, I was depressed for nine years. But then even before that, there were things that don't feel right. Like mm. going back to Lisa Barone, Lisa Barone and I were super, we were besties at one point. And then oh. like, I did something there I'm not proud of. And I look back at it and I'm like, that's never going to change. And I screwed things up. I wouldn't want to have been friends with myself back then either. <laughs> and now I'm like, you know what? I might actually be able to tolerate myself. <laughs> so, you know, it's weird. I'm reading like Naval Ravi Khan, um, the founder of Angelus. He, he's writing that he, there's a, a book right now and there's a PDF version that you can get for free. But you can buy the book, um, the almanac of, of, of Naval Ravi Khan. And he, he talks about inside the book um, about how people don't change. And, I to the to mo most of the extent I agree with that, but then I look at myself and I'm like, I think there was always that there was my potential was always within. It was just it was always buried by like you know by by a, a lot of pain and trauma that I had gone through, and I didn't realize that we you don't have that awareness. Solving the depression solution, I don't think there's an easy answer to it because it's almost like you don't know that you have it when you're in the moment. Sure. You kind of I think I think and it's difficult looking back, you know. Maybe what you need to do is retroactively look back. When was the last time you were truly happy mm -hmm. to, to see if there's a baseline? Because I look back and I'm like, I don't think I really, like, again, I don't think I started living in, until like maybe like two years ago. And okay. yeah. even yeah. as a child, like I, I, I went through, I went through, I went through bouts of depression as a child and I, I, there, there, the, the struggle is longer than beyond just this, this just the seven years. So sure. or nine uh, years. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So maybe on the flip side, it, it, it certainly seems like it's, it's individualized. Each person handles depression differently or they don't recognize it until they do. And it's some, something triggers it. What can we do as a community? If you've had a chance to think about this, how can we help others live their best lives and, and help them to maybe not fall into depression. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I will say that in general, I think it's difficult. Um, three, four years ago, Jamie Surovich took his life. Mm. And he, you know, he's a, he was SEO egghead and he happens to be one of my closer friends. I mean, he had come over, we had, you know, seen each other. He actually used to live in the town over. And I remember, like, I knew he was going through a lot. And I remember after he passed, I wrote like a letter to him. Like, I wish I knew, I wish I knew. Like, that was maybe one of the hardest things for me because I did kind of know but I didn't know how to, like, I didn't know that it was, like, you always think that, you know, people might be going through hard times, but would they go through hard times to the extent that they would be willing to end it all? Um, we lost a few in the industry that way, too. So Yeah. I that was, a, that was not, that was not the, yeah, there was, like, a trifecta, at least. Um, Simple, yeah. I and, can think of a few. I mean, they're young. They were young guys. And Very I, young. I mean, yeah. we've been, we, our industry certainly has suffered through a substantial amount. I mean, it's, it's been really hard. Um, and I, I look back, especially, I, I mean, I knew, I knew Straco, I knew Jill mm -hmm. and then going to like Jamie, like I knew him even more. And what's the answer? I, I wish I had an answer. I just, how, how do we do it as a community? We need to check in on our friends, but you know, the problem is that how much are they willing to share, mm -hmm. you know? And, sure. and, and at a certain point to some degree, some people might be annoyed by that. I, mm -hmm. when I was at the worst of my depression, I think I alienated a lot of people because I was complaining all the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a point in my life where it could have been a little worse, you know? There was, there was definitely thoughts that, you know, I, like, I don't want to just say, I don't want to use that word because I'm not going to use that word, but there, it couldn't, it might not necessarily 
um, it was unfathomable, unfathomable to me, but at the same time, it wasn't unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, by that point, I had alienated everybody and nobody really wanted to talk to me. And the problem is that I think that when you're really in that place, at the point in your life, alienation, like that's the worst thing that could happen. And yet everybody, I think a lot of people do that because eventually if somebody's choosing to take their life, it's probably because they're not like, they've probably pushed away uh, all of their good friends. Mm. Um, for me in a way, almost I've become less dependent on people in general. And I try not to get too close to people because if I get too close to people, it becomes like, I feel like I end up burning it. Like Lisa and I, thankfully we've reconciled in a way that, you know, we're not super close. I, we both respect each other. We like each other. We love each other, but we're not like in the way I think that we're, I think, and I think me and pers- personally, and this is just sort of my shortcoming. I, that depend, I, I develop unhealthy dependencies on people. Mm. Um, and I, I almost don't want to do that. Like, I know that I have to create, I have to put my own inter- internal barriers. I almost have to um, break up relationships um, and prevent them from going in, any further which comes at an expense to myself. Like I'm closer, I used to be closer with a lot of other people and now I'm just casually acquainted with them or I'm close, I'm friendly with them. And I don't know how, I'm, I don't know the solution for other people though. I just it's know for tough, myself. Tough. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, other people, most people need the social connection. I do too, but I feel like if I get too socially connected, I become unhealthily socially connected. So for myself, mm-hmm. I know I have to withdraw. Um, you know, this is not, where one, and it's not, I'm not averse to this conversation. This is not exactly where I expected this conversation to go because this is sound, sounds like I'm talking in a therapeutic, like here, this is therapy here. But I think when it comes to us as going, doing to kind of summarize, when it comes to us as a community, we need to be there for each other and we need to actually have a community. We need to have a community as a whole where in aggregate we can support each other. Mm-hmm. And that kind of, kind of ties back to the whole coronavirus. And when we suffered from coronavirus, I think the saving grace for me was that we had a community um, and we were, we got there early. And I just was given up. I actually ended up, like I said, I, I love that. And I thrived on that. I got a phone call on Monday um, or Tuesday that I was nominated for a, uh, the Julian Y. Bernstein uh, Distinguished Service Award for the local Westchester, my county uh, Jewish council. And I was, they, and I apparently won the award for this quarter, this year, the tw- year 2020, because Wonderful. I ended up taking such a, an aggressive stance and posture in terms of like helping that community and taking it. Um, and, and congratulations. Building, like, That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. This is my first, like, this was a big thing. This is not is. Ego, the way I didn't No, is, I don't I, see it I, as I, ego tomorrow. Not, not, not at all. And yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing all of this, by the way, it is absolutely useful. And this, this episode will air and, and listeners can hear this. This episode will air this month in December with all of the holidays. And I think that a lot of these feelings are at peak for a lot of people. Yeah. And um, this is the time to discuss it. So thank you. And I I appreciate you sharing so much. Yeah. I mean, listen, I know that some of this might be oversharing. I hope it's relatable to some other people. I am, I do want to be approachable to the extent I don't, I just, I just, you know, I, I, I want to become approachable. I want to help people. But I also am afraid because my depression usually tr- it gets triggered by helping people and I get invested in wanting to help people and it becomes like a mission of mine and then my health kind of suffers as a result. So like, I almost want to like, how do we as a community do it? Hopefully there are other people who are stronger than me because I've, I've done this. I've, I've definitely gone through this trajectory in a very, very extreme way twice. Sure. Mm-hmm. And it, I lost several years of my life to it because of that investment and that emotional investment in trying to help to try trying to help other people. I don't think I've minored in psychology, but can never be a psychologist. <laughs> sure. Yes. The, the, the best help is professional help and recognizing that you are indeed depressed um, or yeah. at least have some sort of condition that you need to go talk it out and get, get the right help from the right people. I mean, but ultimately, I, uh, I think most of us need it. We just, yeah. all of us need it. And, and you know. Everybody needs a therapist. <laughs> I probably need a therapist right now. And I've been taking, I took the class. And for, for anyone who might want to help, you got it. You, again, you need to be of the mindset that you can, you, you can help yourself. But yes. um, Coursera came out with a course um, in, in the beginning of the pandemic in, in April, I think, uh, called The Science of Wellbeing, offered by Professor Lori Santos. And it was obviously, we needed, we needed right now to feel good for ourselves. Uh, and it's being offered for free. 
from Coursera. I think anybody should take that, but you also have to be of the mindset that you should adopt it. So they take you, they, they let you take this uh, Yale quiz called the PERMA. I forget what the PERMA stands for, but you, you get scored on your happiness level and then you do a couple of, then you listen, you learn the stuff and then you actually go through practices of applying those, those, those learnings to your life. And then you take the PERMA again in like seven to eight weeks and they, you will see that your happiness scores um, improve. So I think that if anybody wants to do that and are truly willing to help themselves, you have to have that willingness. You could help. It, it's extraordinarily helpful, extraordinarily helpful. And if, you can even have a score of like eight, which is a, an amazingly good score. And probably still, you could still benefit from therapy. I think all of us can. That's awesome. If you, yes. If, I agree. if you feel like you need to do it, exactly what you said. Awesome. Well, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I, I love the personal stuff and I, I feel like I could ask you a million more questions because this is, it's interesting to me. And I do think that um, we can help each other in small ways, in our own ways, um, all the time. And, uh, and, and I think you've hit on so many ways to do that. So thank you so much for that. You shared earlier in the show and um, part of this is a, is a visual on YouTube. So, so the YouTube people who are watching this will be able to see that massive stack of cards that you hand wrote for all of the initial orders for Tamar. What was your secret to getting so many orders as a, as a newly launched fragrance in that hyper competitive space? How did that look for you? And what, or what have you done to launch your business uh, uh, inside of this pandemic? So it wasn't easy. And I will tell you that friends and family are your saviors when you do a crowdfunding campaign. <laughs> so that was, uh, that's the solution. Honestly, that's the answer. Uh, ultimately the, the main, my main, my main supporters, um, with a very small fraction of strangers was friends, family, and like the community, because, you know, when I, I, like I said, I won this distinguished award of helping the community. Some people were like, I'm going to, I'll support her by buying her fragrance and they get product out of it. So well, it was awesome. worth it. And, and the industry, when I say friends and family, the industry certainly showed up as well. And, and some, some, uh, like I was, I was, I just will say, I'm very thankful to all of the industry people who have came in and kind of came out of nowhere almost the, yeah, I'm going to support her venture. And like people are, people are liking it so far. So, and, and obviously that's important to have, especially someone with a social media presence to kind of share that and say, Oh, I bought it and I'm trying it on and giving the tweets and the, and, and all those other things. I, I need that visibility. It's so important. So I I'm dependent upon that. Anybody listening from the industry, by all means, please buy it <laughs> because social media posts, there's a hashtag to marvelous. To marvelous. Did you yeah. come up with that? Is that one of your marketing one, things? One, one of my people, one of my people did. That's awesome. I love it. To marvelous. Yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> That's brilliant. So, yeah. so it was a community thing. You, you had, um, because of your contributions and giving to others first, you have this audience that was willing to share and help. Um, because you, you are incredibly giving, even, even with, uh, um, before you, you fell into depression, even through depression, as, as I followed you, I've seen you um, just constantly give to others and help others. And uh, so, so, so that's awesome. Big stack of orders from getting it shared. It was all viral. Was any of that paid? Any paid uh, ads? Uh, those slightly. orders? No, no, barely. I, I didn't do any. I didn't do any uh, um, acquisition, user acquisition, in that front. I'm I'm running a, a, some ads right now, but like I'm not a PPC expert. I had a hundred dollar credit. I'm like I'm just gonna throw up an it's ad because it yeah. expire. It actually expires today. So I was like I'm gonna do it right now. Do it. That's and, awesome. I mean, there's nothing happening. I you know at the end of the day, I'm not sure I'm really necessarily. I don't have the product in hand. Like those those bottles right now. Like I might be able to pick up my bottles tomorrow. I'm still waiting for confirmation, but they're going to be ready right away. Like, that's and awesome. I, that's why I, it took me like, you know, three weeks to rewrite those. That's actually um, probably 60% of the orders. That's the wow. rest of them have been fulfilled. And, and I, I got to hand deliver some and I got to ship them out. It was, been, it's great. been kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, they're, there there's a lot to be doing a lot to be done and you obviously have to to break it up in pieces and all those things so. yeah so so it's all been through social media though is that what i understand yeah yeah social yeah because pr no no one really was doing much in the pr space like no one really mm -hmm. wants to cover this story the anecdotal experience is nice i did have several people um come up to me and say and and, and that's because i was actually on gary v 
So mm -hmm. Gary, think, Gary did propel a little bit of, of visibility and people had, a lot of people were actually just came up to me, oh my God, you know Gary V, that's amazing. Can you get me an introduction with Gary after this? <laughs> Man, you know how hard it was for me, but um, but then but other people had come up to me and they said, "Listen, your story actually resonates with me because perfume has actually brought me out of depression too." That's and awesome. That was that's validation, but that obviously uh, PR people are not really responsive to that right now. I would like to potentially commission a study, a legitimate study, to show that if you would apply perfume with the mindset that I articulated on my postcards, that it it actually it could actually have a, a longitudinal impact, like. Is that one thing that you could do and take that permit score in the beginning and then take that permit test again? Mm -hmm. And could it change your life? It's very possible. Um, but I, I want to do that in the, the, the appropriate um, psychological uh, setting. And I've reached out to a numerous professors all over this, the United States uh, and, and not, have not gotten reception yet. So okay. also, it's very difficult. I mean, to, to commission yes. a study like this, it's not, it's, it costs a lot of money. So I was like thinking, you know, maybe I'll leverage um, like a PhD candidate who needs to potentially do some sort of, uh, you know, degree requirements. And I asked that question in the middle of the summer when there was nobody on campus anyway. So a lot of people are like, well, we don't have school now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so in, in due time, I would like to, to get validation because I think that market validation will propel the visibility and certainly have some sort of credence to the claim. But all of what I did was 100% organic for the most part. Um, and other people in the community support specifically said, listen, we've done so much, Tamara's done so much for us, let's do something for her. Yes, so absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I mean, I didn't do it with the expectation of anything. I would have liked to have raised more. You know, I, I definitely fell short of my goal uh, and my, uh, my mental goal of, of raising more. I, but I did pretty well for myself considering I'm a brand that you've never smelled before and you kind of need to, like you're not, you don't yeah, know yeah. what the hell you're going to buy. Yeah, it's, it's a try and buy type of a niche. So that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And I've had people who have told me that it's like the most amazing thing they've ever smelled. And then I've also had people like, I like this one a lot better than this one. <laughs> and then I have, I like, and some people don't have the body chemistry. So yeah, buying fragrance online without doing your due diligence is extremely, extremely risky. And then this is a, it's not necessarily the most cost effective product investment. Sure. But yeah. you do it because you believe in the story and you believe in the entrepreneur entrepreneur behind it and also all the people who are validating the fact that it's good. And then hopefully things are different. You know, you've mentioned it a few times and I think that's one key takeaway. Um, actually, there's, there's, a, there's a few big takeaways from, from this so far that, that I've gotten. You definitely have to give, and I feel like Gary V popularized that, but you've been giving way before Gary V hit the scenes and became popular also. So I, I think that's awesome. Um, yeah, I just don't have the, I don't, I don't have the personality, unfortunately. <laughs> I need to practice that. <laughs> No, I think you've been giving, and I mean, it, it shows, right? Because you launched this brand seemingly out of nowhere because it's not related to the niche that you've um, become popular in. It's not related to the niche that you've given so much to, but right. everybody comes together to share it, to support it in their own way and to help. And I think that's really, really good to see that community come together. So, so it's, it's yeah. part of giving. And then the other piece that I think is crucial that, that, that everybody should test, but also having a deeply emotional story attached to it, which your story adds a lot of meaning to the, the intentional fragrance sort of slogan that you have on your homepage right now. I was going to ask, what does intentional fragrance mean? But I think you've already told us. I think you've shared right. that story and it makes that um, so much more appealing right. to yeah, buy and to, to, to tie into. I, I was trying to figure out the messaging for a while and you know, unisex fragrance for yourself, like your unisex fragrance for, for happiness was kind of like sort of the direct, I had a couple of things in the beginning a mindful fragrance for a happier you. And certainly it, there is a mindfulness play to it. And I think that's really important, but um, intentional self-care, uh, it's an incentive, it, it's, yeah, it, it's intentional fragrance for your self-care ritual right now. And that was a, it was, it was a conversation I was having with somebody like on one of these, like, you know, in a Zoom chat and I just shared my story. And the whole idea is that when you put on perfume, you need to have an intention. Revisit that intention throughout the day, it'll change your life. That is my, that's my story. And when, when it like, 
you could wear my perfume, you could wear anybody's perfume and have the same mindset. But because mine is so different, you could potentially align new memories with it. A lot of people, they'll remember something, but it'll have so many other memories associated with it that it's not going to have the same power. So any new per perfume could potentially change this. Hopefully it's mine. Like <laughs> but like yeah, at the yeah. end of the day, it's at, at the end of the day, it's not about necessarily buying my perfume. Like I want to spread a, a, a brand message. And in a way I want to spread some, like I have to potentially anchor this like ph philosophy to a particular product. Mm -hmm. I think anybody could use this right now. And I keep saying, and I, t I put this on my Instagram, like messages, like, Put on perfume right now, do this, revisit this. And people have actually told me it actually works. But again, I need some science, science, two science behind it to get us two sample size that is reflective of, of my science actually having two validation. <laughs> well, it has some validation in similar studies from the NLP industry, at least, right? Yeah. There's a lot of corollary, corollary, I don't know how the word, um, but there are a lot of like, similar uh studies that kind of are there but i really want to have something that's so that that really validates that hypothesis it's not i'm not i'm not quite there yet yeah no i i'm sure you'll find it um because of those corollary studies that that you're talking about now i'm curious can you tell us about the gary v show how did you get on was it simply because of a friendship or did you have to do some outreach and Coordinate yep. schedules. What, 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 what does that look like? Gary's a hard guy to reach. <laughs> I'll put it that way. I'm sure. No, I'm Gary's sure not, he is. It, was a, it, was, it was a tremendous amount of outreach. It was like, hey, because, you know, the thing is that he's not ignoring you. The Gary's the nicest guy in the world. Like, he is, he actually put me into this, like, mindset of, like, how do I help so many more people? Because he, he actually made me feel happy. Like, doing this kind of thing, uh -huh. I was happy. But, like, you know, it, it's a struggle. It, it's a 100% struggle. All of a sudden, he, like, elevated me. Like, the way he does it, it's just amazing. But... That's you know, he's not necessarily ignoring you. He's just a busy guy. Like, he's just such a busy guy. So you have to nag, and then you have to nag again, and you have to nag again, <laughs> and then nag again. There are certainly other people who won't do that. There's, a, there's another guy, and I'm not going to name who he is, in the industry, very close friend of mine, uh -huh. uh, or at one point he was. And I reached out to him about my campaign. He actually had a very, very successful Kickstarter campaign. But when I reached out to him, I didn't reach out to him as a guy who had Kickstarter campaign. I reached out to him as, as just who he was. Mm -hmm. And I think he thought I was like going to use him for Kickstarter, but I never even approached that in that context. And I, like, you know, I said, here, this and that. And I reached out to him a few times. And eventually at the end, like I needed like three people to like push me over the edge before the campaign ended. And I sent him an email and like his response was actually a very, very negative. Like his passive aggressive response was let me unfriend on Facebook. Oh, shoot. And I was like, that's not what Gary would have done. Yeah, it was, it was pretty painful because I have a tremendous amount of respect for this guy. And I didn't look at him as, oh, you were successful in Kickstarter. So let me leverage you. I never wanted that. It was just like, mm -hmm. hey, I just launched this thing. Can you help me out with it in any way? Can you introduce me to PR people? Like that was sort of like the, the, the angle. And then finally, I'm like, I need one order to hit my goal. Can you be that one order? And his response was no response. And then I noticed that he wasn't friends with me on Facebook anymore. And I approached oh, him about it. And I, I apologized mm. because apparently I hurt his feelings or something. And he's like, we're all good. But then I tried to re-add him on Facebook and he rejected it. So oh, I was like, shoot. oh, we're not all good. So oh, like, man. I will say that there, Gary Vee is an incredible guy. And not any, and I would like to say hashtag be like Gary V. Uh, not an easy thing for people to do. Um, it isn't, yeah, and it's unfortunate absolutely. because I really think that this other individual just thought I was using him because of his Kickstarter connections. But I, like I know, like that to me isn't like I didn't even remember his Kickstarter thing until he actually finally when I reached Imagine out. I, and then he's like, oh, you know, so many people reach out to me in the context of Kickstarter. And I'm like, but that's not how I see you. I just see you as my friend. I've known you, but I've known you for 15 years prior to your Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> it wasn't a second. Like, it wasn't. I just see you as like. It's like it's 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 that thing where you know your friend becomes super. I don't know how many people have this, but your friend becomes super famous. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. see your friend as this famous new person. You see them as the person they were before, and that's how I look at my friendships and uh, this friendship. It's sort of like the same thing. Well, Gary, I knew Gary when he was like starting to really make his his um 
rise to his his fame to why so, yeah. you know that climb and and like I, like i knew this guy well but he was just a nobody working at a, at a, a in this industry and that, it, it, that that i will say that that was probably one of the worst things that had come out of this but then we have gary unfortunately it was a good thing yeah i know that was a tangent <laughs> that's great well that's awesome thank you for sharing that story well, I, I, I know I've, I've kept, I've tied you up for, for over an hour here. Your thoughts and advice and stories are absolutely incredible. Um, for anybody listening or watching, definitely go to tomorrow.com, see what she's built out of this story and this brand. It's absolutely amazing to see. Um, I applaud the efforts and the strength that it took tomorrow um, to pull out of depression. I think yeah, that's, a, that's yeah. an incredible feat. It might be one of the biggest uh, feats that anybody can ever do for themselves personally. And I, I admire that you have been able to do that. And I hope that your story resonates with a few of our listeners um, today. So do, do you have any last uh, words of advice before we wrap up the show today? Uh, so one other piece of advice that I would give to everybody else is that, especially if you're struggling right now, find something you love and just like commit to a, a regular practice of it. Um, I think that also helped me. So like, when I when I started enjoying perfume, I also started like doing karaoke on smule.com. dot oh, awesome. like I didn't have a voice for many years. I didn't speak for like you said you were gone for eight years. Like I didn't speak yeah. for like seven years, and like all of a sudden, like I felt like because even though I'm not like the most amazing singer, but I can keep a tune and I can harmonize pretty well. Um, I felt like all of a sudden I could start using my voice again. Now certainly my voice isn't amazing, and <laughs> it's funny. I'll tell, I'm gonna share this funny story. I went to my psychiatrist and I shared with him my smule. This is toward the end of the like, I was trying to get myself out of there. He's like, <laughs> I, I showed him, I, I, sang, I sang the song Confrontation, uh, the Lay Miz song. If you're familiar, it's like mm -hmm. completely different parts going together. It's a great song. And I sang it and, uh, and I shared it with my psychiatrist and he listens to it. And he's like, oh, you're the guy you did a duet with. He has a great voice. <laughs> I'm like, what about me? I'm like, he, and I will say I was sort of offended, but he didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's oh, like no. he's like. Oh, listen, I can keep a note. I I I, I, you know, I when I was also this that's also where ego came from because when I was in in elementary school and choir and all those things, I was given all the solos. She loved me so much, so my expectation was one day I'll be an American Idol. Oh, <laughs> wow. yeah. Yeah. No, but <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, like I like I said, you know, most people sound normal, and there's other people who sound like they've actually had singing lessons, and that guy sounded like he had singing lessons. So that was that. So, um, I felt, but all of a sudden I felt the confidence to maintain it. Like he didn't give, I didn't give up at that point. And that's, that's when I realized I hit a tipping point. But okay. We're, what my takeaway is, I, I would think for most people in general, I think this, this will just help people anyhow. I think people need to think, just don't overthink anything. I think most of us, and I think that's sort of like, it becomes, um, it becomes a actually dangerous behavior. Um, and it's, it's, it's destructive to, uh, to overthink just about anything. I'm, I'm finally, I'm, I'm starting to respond to my gut without over, like without thinking about anything. And I have been so much more happier for it. So I think everybody in general needs to kind of just take off, take that mindset that, and, and hopefully um, make things a little more natural and don't like, don't put yourself in a, make your gut decisions are probably right. Awesome. I love that. Thank you again so much, Tamar, for being on the show. If, if anybody would like to follow Tamar, um, interact with Tamar, she's incredible. She is truly a giver. I can attest to that, be a testimonial to that. She is incredibly kind. Follow her at Tamar, T-A-M-A-R, um, on Instagram or Twitter. Go to Tamar.com, T-A-M-A-R.com, which, by the way, Tamar, I thought you always owned that. So it was great to hear oh, that you it purchased was a, that. It, was it came from buy. the industry. It was, it, it was owned by a, U, United, uh, a, a UK marketing industry back in the day. But now oh, that's amazing. Awesome. That's yep. awesome. Yeah. Um, also, Tamar Essences, T-A-M-A-R-E-S-S-E-N-C-E-S -S -E -S -E -S on Instagram and Twitter, right? For, yeah, for, and, uh, and Tamar Essences. Yeah, that's, that Tamar Essences, I get very raw and vulnerable. And I mean, you could follow on LinkedIn too, but um i, oh, I yes, share a lot of a lot of very 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 stories that people would be like wow somebody's actually putting that stuff out there because i think a lot of people just don't talk about this the pain that they suffer within because we just when we're online 
we have to position our best selves and not the stuff that we go through and the difficulties that we go through. But you have to do it in a way that you're obviously not like clamoring for that attention and help. And I think a lot of people do. Um, I, do, I, do, I do it knowing I don't have an audience. <laughs> it's almost safer that way. <laughs> it's safer. It's safer for, for the moment. No, that's funny. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Tamar.